dog's butt in the back of this video. That's Tulip. Take mommy to the train station. Oh, there she is. Hey. Oh man, how cute is she, right? She's adorable. Hi everyone. So, um, I, oh, traffic. Stop tickling me. He's tickling me while he's driving. Stop tickling me. <laughs> On my way up to school today, it's really hot. This is like Indian summer. It's like 90 degrees out. Um, so this week, I'm going to tell you about it more in a little bit. This week, I had a little better time management with regard to my studying. And also, I felt a little more capable of what I had to accomplish. It doesn't mean it took me less than 30 hours to accomplish it. But I still, I feel really good about the material. Um, I have a study buddy that I've been kind of studying with. She's amazing. Her name is Nalini, and she's in California. And by the way, she's married has a child in a full-time job not just a child but a baby and is handling this class and she's awesome so I, I don't even know how she does it it's, it's really amazing I mean I just I guess we women can just tackle everything at the same time and still get it done meanwhile I'm like god I can't even like you know take a shower and feed my dog by the time I have to get out of the house okay, so so that's going really well uh, and I, I do feel that I understand the material. I really, really do. You know what I did? And I'll, I'll have to take a picture of this, but I have, in my basement, I have a treadmill and I have kind of like a little theater that this man set up for me. Which is awesome. So it's like the, I have my, set up my computer. I can watch YouTube or Netflix while I'm on my treadmill. And I watched nonstop videos on singular regression and multiple regression last week. Oh my god, I'm such a nerd. I, I'm painful. Um, but that was really helpful because it got all in my head while I was walking and I, I, it's coming along. I get it. I'm getting it. I'm going to get on the train in a few and I will get back to you. Stop tickling me. He's tickling me again, damn it. <laughs> hear me out here. I know the, the sound isn't going to be awesome. Um, another beautiful night up here and getting ready to go into class. Like I said, this week we're talking about multiple regression. Aren't you excited? I know I am. Uh, somebody asked me a really interesting question on YouTube the other night. The question was, how long does it take to recover from overtraining syndrome? And are you recovered from overtraining syndrome? Does it take longer to recover than it does to end up overtrained does it take shorter what is the time frame all this stuff and um there's no definitive answer to this just want to make that clear i certainly don't have an answer i think that i would say personally that it is um this is a hard question to answer it is no longer my goal to return to the level of fitness i had when i became uh overtrained. Um, it is no longer my goal to continue to compete as an ultra runner. I'm not really thinking of that. I'm just thinking about overall health. So because this is not my overall goal, I am not actually pushing the envelope and trying to train in effect. What has ended up happening is that I'm just doing my thing and hoping to feel good physically every day. That being said, I have a lot of pain still. Um, my threshold for pain and uh, my threshold for let's say destroying my body is pretty low I feel everything at this point as I have said before I think a lot of this is an age thing let's let's not forget that I'm quite a bit older than a lot of the people that are probably watching this video and hoping that they will have a chance to get back to their sport I'm not, I know that I'm not 100% I don't know that I ever will be that's just a fact and I don't know how I feel about that. I don't, I don't know if it's bothering me right now. I don't really wanna go back to the way things were. So I'm just willing to walk away from it for now. 
which is which is fine. That's my choice. It, it's not everyone's choice, and um, I know people have come back and been able to do certain things. Whether or not they're healthy is a different story. <laughs> There's no clear answers. I believe anything's possible. I really do. The ways in which you can ensure success in terms of recovery from overtraining, that's subject for a whole other video. But if it's really important to you, the sky's the limit, I think, you know, why not? I'd like to think we're all unstoppable. I've said it before. Going into class now, hoping I don't freeze my butt off per usual. Um, my anxiety level over the material for this class is much lower this week. That's absolutely true. Much, much lower this week. And a lot of that, like I said, has to do with the fact that I think that it's all coming together. However, my time commitment is still the same. I have a two hour class on Monday nights. Um, I have Zoom review sessions, which are sort of like teleconferences, Thursday nights, Saturday afternoons, and Sunday nights. Each one is about an hour or an hour and a half plus a lot of conference calls with my research team. So we're talking about a pretty hefty time commitment aside from all the reading and homework and everything else. It's no joke. It's beautiful, but they make you work for it. And that's fine by me. Tuesday morning and I'm um, going for a little walk. Um, I'm on a bike path right now, which I think you can see, but there's no one around, so I thought I would say hi for a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to update everyone and I got my homework grade back from this last homework, which was the one that took me probably over 30 hours to complete, and I got a 10, which I'm pretty excited about. And actually, I messed up because my first homework that I had said that I got a 9 on, I actually got a 10. I read it wrong. <laughs> yeah, if you can't read what your grade actually is, that's probably an issue. <laughs> so I'm very excited um, about that. The homework for this week looks like it's going to be a killer, so I'm getting ready to start that. ASAP, I'm really tired today. <laughs> I'm gonna say. So the other thing I just wanted to mention is that yesterday when I was sitting at Harvard Yard and I was talking about overtraining syndrome, I was pretty melodramatic because I was saying how it's no longer a goal of mine to pursue ultra running. And I don't want that to seem um, that I'm being negative or dramatic. It's, it's not that at all. It's just that right now, in terms of priorities in my life and what my body is telling me, this, this is not the moment for that. And I'm, I'm really okay with it. My body has shown me repeatedly that it doesn't want to be training hard at all. Even when I run for more than my hour, I'm in a lot of pain physically. Some of that, of course, doesn't have anything to do with overtraining syndrome at all. It's just that I have old injuries that are really starting to aggravate me. So that's something, there's bikers behind me. I'm always so nervous. Okay, so I'm back. So I just, I'm just listening to my body and doing what's right for me right now. But that's not the same as saying that uh, recovery from overtraining syndrome is something that's unattainable. I don't think there's enough science for us to understand the mechanisms by which that can be a possibility for people. And because it's a systemic issue, I don't think that we have the, a 
ability to look at the wide range of systems that are affected by overtraining syndrome and say which markers suggest healing versus not for every person there's not a blanket statement i know for me as i said i'm not at the place right now where i'm pursuing that which means that for people that are pursuing it and hopefully working closely with their healthcare practitioners they can have some kind of intelligence about how their progress is going for me it's not a priority right now i'm very happy with where i am and you guys all know that since I've gone back to school, pretty much all my time is dedicated to that. I feel that I have a higher sense of purpose. I'm always advocating for us discovering the things about ourselves that are wonderful, irrespective of our athletic abilities. I know that I feel incredibly lucky to be taking on the challenge academically that I am right now. Making space in my life for this right now is, is really awesome. So practicing what I preach, I am currently more focused on that than I am on worrying about being able to run a 50 miler. It's going to be different for everyone and I think that if your goal still is to return to your sport in some way and you're young and you're healthy and you're working with healthcare practitioners and all your biomarkers are there and everything looks good, do it. And as I told you before, teach us all how. I get a little distracted so I wanted to make sure I didn't sound too um, melodramatic when I was chatting with y'all last night before class. That's it. So today I'm going to be finishing up this walk. I'm going to go home, probably edit all these videos and put them together. Hope everyone is having a beautiful start to their week and I'll see you in a little bit. Hi everybody. Hope you enjoyed the little vlog that I did again this time. Okay, this is going to be a really quick video, but I've been getting a lot of questions this week with regard to different kinds of information that women are getting when they go to see a healthcare practitioner of some kind. I'm using the term healthcare practitioner kind of broadly. What I'm talking about is anyone that you might go to see that you hope will be able to give you some kind of guidance or advice and information about your recovery from amenorrhea. This can be a doctor, it can be a nurse, it can be someone who is, let's say, an ultrasound tech or another type of tech that you might encounter in the medical environment. It can be a nutritionist, it can be a naturopath, it can be anyone, again, anyone that you might see that may be trying to offer you guidance. There are certain kind of themes that I hear over and over again, certain pieces of advice that I hear girls get. It's hard to keep track of the information that we get, especially in a doctor's office. It can be nerve-wracking, that's for sure. Or perhaps if we're going to see a different type of practitioner, let's say a naturopath for the first time, it might be a little overwhelming because it's a different way of hearing information. So sometimes girls will email me and ask me questions about some of the things that they heard. And while I know that all of it is well-intentioned and well-meaning, there is a lot of it that, quite frankly, raises red flags. These are not red flags like, don't do this thing. They are red flags inviting you to be an informed consumer. These types of red flags are the ones that you should listen to, think about, and research. It's your job to continue to ask questions when you're not sure that you understand what you're being told. So just to be clear, these are not things that you shouldn't do or shouldn't listen to. These are things that when you hear them, it should turn on that switch in your head that says, okay, I need to go investigate this. So I'm going to give you five red flags to listen for. And a full disclaimer here, remember, 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 I am not a doctor. I am not a nutritionist. I am a lowly graduate student hopeful. I have absolutely no business telling you to listen to or not listen to any of the following. I have my theories and scientific basis on why I think these things are concerning. And while I have a lot of experience with this stuff, it doesn't make me any type of authority. Let's remember that. Number one, when it is suggested to you that you go on birth control pills or any other type of birth control to regulate or jumpstart hormones, this is red flag number one. The logic and science behind this is real fuzzy. Please do some research. Number two is hormone replacement therapy. When it is suggested to you that you either take a pill or use a cream or any other method that is going to deliver estrogen and or progesterone to you and you are not menopausal, this is an area that will raise a red flag. There are many reasons why it is important for you to inform yourself about the pros and cons of hormone replacement therapy when you are not at all menopausal. Again, please do your due diligence here. Number three, if and when you are ever diagnosed with PCOS. PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
If you have seen a doctor for hypothalamic amenorrhea, chances are you've heard this term before. Some of the diagnostic criteria for PCOS is a little bit ambiguous. For this reason, it is extremely important that you double, triple check that this diagnosis absolutely does pertain to you. The reason why this is important is because the lifestyle changes necessary to manage PCOS are the exact opposite of the lifestyle changes you're gonna to need to manage hypothalamic amenorrhea. Therefore, again, do your research. Number four are herbs. Herbs are very interesting. If you have been offered herbs by anyone at any time to manage your hormones, this should raise a red flag. I've heard it all before, ashwagandha, holy basil, rhodiola, whatever they are. Again, I'm gonna hold my opinion on this and not say if it's good or bad, but what I am gonna do is remind you, herbs are not regulated by the FDA. It's very important that you understand where they are coming from. It is very important that you understand how they are dosed. It is very important that you understand what the possible side effects can be. Please be careful with this stuff. And finally, the fifth thing that should raise a red flag for you is if anyone at any time tells you that in order to navigate your situation that you should be fasting. I know this sounds incredible, but I actually have had people write to me and tell me that it has been suggested to them that they try things like intermittent fasting in order to get their hormones back online. Fasting is dangerous, no matter how you look at it. You wanna give it a fancy name that sounds like fitness, fine, but it's dangerous. And again, I urge you to make sure that you're making the right choice. Some tips to make sure that you can manage these red flag items. First of all, take someone with you anytime you see a healthcare practitioner. It's hard to remember everything that's being said and it can be really great to have an extra set of ears. Find reputable sources of information. Don't listen to me or anyone else that you might find on the internet that doesn't have the qualifications to give you the information that you need. There are places that you can find information that is non-biased and science-based. Please familiarize yourself with those sources of information. If you have a question about where you can research something, send me an email and I'll try to head you in the right direction. The next thing is don't be afraid to get a second opinion. If you have the opportunity to see more than one doctor or more than one practitioner about a particular issue, go for it. When it's this important, it's really a great idea to have another voice. And finally, be a pain in the ass. Don't be afraid to make a pest of yourself to get the answers that you need. And if the office that you go to and the doctor that you see is not being kind to you and not getting back to you, find someone who will. I hear a lot of this stuff and it seems to really, really cause a lot of anxiety in a lot of women. Please do your research. Make sure you stay informed. It's super important that you're 100% on board with the treatment. You understand why, you're ready to comply with what they want you to do, and you're totally fine with what the outcome is going to be. I hope this was helpful. I just want to make sure that everybody is thinking. Thank you so much for following me on Instagram and also finding me on Facebook. I'm seeing a few of you download a free copy of the ebook of Frequently Asked Questions over on acaseofthegills.com. I hope that you're enjoying it. I'd really love to hear your feedback. Also remember that we're taking submissions now for the blog for women to share their personal stories about their journey through hypothalamic amenorrhea. You don't actually have to be recovered yet in order to submit your story. Women all over the world will absolutely benefit from hearing your story no matter what part of the journey you're on. Thank you so much for spending your time with me this afternoon. I will see you soon.